In today's episode, I talked to Houston Craft of Character Strong. So I gotta be real with you, I was not expecting much out of this conversation. Sorry, Houston, but wow, I was totally wrong. This guy is an amazing storyteller. He actually gets paid three to five figures per speech on building character and he speaks in schools and is just a really kind guy, not a nice one. He also has a new book out that I've bought called Deep Kindness that I do recommend that you check it out as well. If you wanna be kinder and a more fun person, plus have a lot of smiles, you will love this conversation. Here's three gigantic things you're gonna take away. Number one, how to give amazing speeches. Number two, ways to be kind. And it actually influenced me right after I had this conversation with him. And number three, how does he actually make three to five figures per speech? Enjoy those three things, plus a bunch more ear nuggets along the way. I just read this amazing book called Kingdom of Ice. Uh huh. Have you heard about this book? I don't know. No. no. It, and basically, it was about this uh, the people trying to find the North Pole for the first time. And what was interesting, it was. One, they had electric cars and stuff like that back then in the 18, in late 1800s, which was is just kind of bonkers or in early 1900s. Um, and then the second thing was that there was motivational speakers. So the guys who survived coming back from the North mm -hmm. Pole went and spoke about how they survived. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that would be in the drama category, right? These people that come back, <laughs> they're like, wait until you hear about this. <laughs> whatever you're dealing with, however cold you feel now, whatever barriers you need to overcome check this out <laughs> why do you think we we need that as as people why do you think that that inspires i guess it makes sense why it inspires why do you think we need it so much or society likes it so much i think we're desperate for venn diagrams you know we really want to figure out how we intersect with people and i think stories are probably the best way that we know that we currently have to feel intersection you know a little overlap in a venn diagram that's, it's what made me fall in love with theater was like the first time I, I performed on stage. I remember like, you're telling it even at like, a, it's not my story. It's an unoriginal story and you're presenting it to an audience and they feel moved because as they're watching, anytime we listen to a story or watch a story, we can't help but try to intersect it with ours, right? We want to know where that overlap is. And in doing so, we feel closer to whatever it is, the idea, <laughs> the other person. <laughs> I know it's always funny. It's like, here's Elon Musk's morning routine. And it's like, all right, fine. From now on, I'm always going to eat Raisin Bran. You know, like, <laughs> like, yeah, like that's, that's you... not my Venn diagram with Elon Musk. <laughs> I, I, I mean, that's kind of an interesting question, though. It's like, how have you been motivated or inspired based on other people to on, on this journey that you're on? Yeah, I think the first, like one of the early things that I wanted for myself that I saw in, in someone else was the guy that I run character strong now with. Um, he's, he's 10 years older than me. I saw he was actually a speaker at a camp a leadership camp I attended in high school. And one of the things I remember like distinctly thinking to myself was this guy has kind eyes. And I think kind eyes are something you have to earn by just like living compassionately and generously you know when someone like looks at you and you just like feel taken in by the way they show up for you yeah i'm looking at you now though I'm just, you're getting there man you're working on it <laughs> that facial expression is not your best demonstration of kind eyes <laughs> but i remember thinking to myself in high school like i want to earn my way to kind eyes and and it and when, when you see something in someone else that you want for yourself i think that's like that's where this Venn diagram thing starts to happen. Where like, I, we don't have this as an intersection yet, but I'm gonna work my way towards this intersection. Dude, hell yeah. I, um, I finished this book that wasn't very good, uh, but Kingdoms it was- Kingdoms of Ice or was it something? No, else? that book is phenomenal. Uh, true story about <laughs> going to North Pole. There's another book I just finished this morning called Leadership and Self-Deception. Mm. And it's a parably where they're like, Mark and Jim are angry with each other. And the, yeah. the book is okay, but it's actually, there was one really strong message from it. So I guess the book had some points that were, were amazing, which was look at people as people. And I know that sounds so basic, but I, I noticed, I was like, wow, a lot of times when I'm talking to someone, I'm just talking to them like a transaction or I'm talking to them like, here is your function. And so it's like, just take a step back sometimes and, and look at them as a human. And then you might treat them a little bit differently in these experiences. And I think I kind of related mm -hmm. to that with these kind eyes, which is, it's a person and they have their own problems and their own experiences and their own life going on. Yeah. Someone who's, who's, who sees you as that 
it, it reduces the tra- transactionality of the interaction, right? All of a sudden you feel like comfortable and seen and appreciated and belonging. And they're just like, it's just because of their presence. That's a huge gift. It's hard. I mean, I think our, our natural human desire is one of my favorite podcasts is Invi- Invisibilia on NPR. They talk about the invisible things that control our life. And one of the one of the episodes is on categories, and basically categories is one of our survival techniques. We need to, as humans, put things in boxes because if I don't know that this chair is a chair, if I don't know the difference between a chair and a bomb in my brain, then I'm going to live in fear of everything. So we categorize things really naturally. The hard part about categories is that it typically we we can't. There's, there would be in order to get as specific as humans really need us to be to be deeply empathetic with each other in the world the specificity is overwhelming right we have to put people into some semblance of like wholesale boxes and that's one of the big challenges of like seeing people in the fullness of their personhood is that they we are just like way too complicated to take in all at once and so we have to be like all right you're in these three boxes that i already sort of know about and if if any of those boxes have to do with like you're a business dealer like i need this information from you or this task from you then like you have some sort of category that reduces their personhood really naturally you know i've always been confused with like republican and democrat in america because mm-hmm. it's like what if you you don't follow everything they follow and you're like well i yeah. like some of this and i like some of that and uh that is interesting i wonder well it makes sense why we categorize so many different people right it helps us understand them a little bit better or, or yeah i guess understand to make judgments about him or why do we do that like i'm like oh houston's like the flannel wearing nice guy <laughs> what do you you know how, how do you i mean maybe take it a step back how do you think people categorize you uh yeah it's it's actually oh, this is this is a fun path to walk it, it is um one of the most challenging unexpected parts of being a motivational speaker for me was how much uh other people's categorization of me as the kind guy or the nice guy reduced my own capacity to feel anything but that. So I spent a lot of time, the nature of my work for for seven years, I spoke at 600 schools over the course of seven years. And the nature of that work was you show up to a building and every time you walk in that building, it's a first impression but they're paying me to deliver a message that is like well-tested, right? So you don't have a ton of room in my mind at the time. I didn't have a ton of room to like branch out from this thing that I'd worked on and and, and felt really solid with. So I was delivering the same stories on repeat over the across 600 campuses. And each time I walk into the building, I know what I'm about to do, but they don't. And it's a first impression experience. And in my book, I talk about feeling like I became a first impression. And that first impression, when you're the motivational speaker, you got to walk into the school and you got to be the person who's like, it's so good to see. Like you are like the picture of positivity, right? And you're like giving hugs and high fives and so glad to be here. And here's how you can introduce me. And here's what we're going to talk about today. And you spend so much time being a first impression that like there's something very one dimensional about that experience. And I was talking at scale about vulnerability and compassion and being yourself and like in talking about this so frequently, I actually feel like I lost a lot of access to other parts of me. And it deadened a lot of emotional capacities with myself. It ruined a lot of relationships in my life um, because I felt like actually like a weird uh, departure from intimacy uh, because there is something really hard about maintaining depth when you are repeating something so first impression-y over and over and over again. So Can yeah, the kind a... guy thing is it has been hard for me to shake. Do you think of yourself as the kind guy? Or what do you think of yourself as? Yeah, I, I think I've tried to remove that for myself of like being the kind guy. I, I think um, the story of giving myself is that that sometimes feels limiting. Uh, mainly because of culture's perception of what kindness is and then how they in turn perceive me to be if I am the kind guy. I think of myself more as now as someone that that cares deeply about kindness. 
I never to, to share as well. I never thought I, I was the nice guy. I think I have good eyes. Like I've actually gotten a lot of compliments on my eyes because <laughs> they're, they're hazel with flecks of gold. But I've never. Yeah. I thought I thought being like the nice guy was like exclusive for like people that had very like sweet parents. Like my parents are are awesome, but they're you know they're I don't know. I think realistic. And I think there's some parent, kid, some friends of mine, like JR and uh, Mitchell, who's on the call, and some other people. I'm like, man, that's just a nice person. And mm-hmm. only recently this year, I was like, hey, I can, I can be that too. It's kind of like shedding an aware, shedding a false belief or realizing that there's it, almost nothing is exclusive in terms of feelings mm-hmm. or personalities. Like you can be any of that. And I'm like, oh, I can be nice. I can be yeah. like the fun guy, or you can be whatever it is you want, and, and kind of adjust those things over time. Yeah, one of my one of my favorite conversations that we have with with students and with educators, I guess people in general, is like the distinction between personality and character, and how hmm. the personality, the research would suggest, is actually more or less set in our life by the age of seven. Right, the dominant way we prefer to interact with the world, whether that's more introverted or extroverted or somewhere in between, so analytical or creative, somewhere in between, those sorts of things are more or less set in our life by the age of seven we talk about character more distinctly as like the the average person makes 35,000 choices on any given day. You can think about what percentage of those have a bearing on this word character and however you would define that. And I think some people use those even unintentionally as excuses for behavior. So like, I just tell it like it is, you know, I'm just like an assertive person. I'm an honest person. That's my nature. (laughs) <laughs> right, which we pre-correct and we say, you know, maybe your personality is that you're okay being assertive, but your character is like you're being a jerk right now. Like you don't have to be assertive <laughs> in a cruel way. But some people lean on their personality as an excuse for poor character, when in reality they have a choice in how they use that to interact. And I think yeah. the same thing's true about kindness or niceness. Right? Is some people think of like kindness as like this inborn thing. And I think my argument would be that it is built and bred over time through the choices we make daily. All right. Well, taking a step back, because we, we jumped right into the deep end. We didn't even go into the hot <laughs> tub and like have some non-alcoholic beer together. I, how, how does someone become or what, what are you motivating? Is it high school, elementary school? What, what yeah. age was it? Yeah. Who, who am I talking to? Uh, I, I spent seven years pretty exclusively working with middle schools and high schools. <laughs> Uh, over the past three or four years, we, you know, character strong, we, we provide curriculum pre-K through 12th grade. Uh, and I actually work mostly now with adults, educators and conferences and things like that. Because the first thing that, that comes to my mind, and this is going to be a little bit, it's not, I'm not hating. I, I'm just poking because I'm like, did you go to the North Pole? Or, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I guess what qualifies you to motivate these kids and you know, how are, can, can you give me and the listeners or the viewers some, some of that motivation? You know, what, yeah. what parts are you, are you motivating? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I wrestle with that question myself a lot. Being in the more like romantic comedy genre, I lean a lot on in many ways, the averageness of my story to be relatable because the ask mm. isn't dramatic. Like, I, I'm I'm asking for people to try to figure out how we live a more compassionate or empathetic life. And I I get to show be like, overall, I've lived a very basic existence in many ways. Uh, a privileged basic existence, but a pretty basic existence nonetheless. And so I think that is one of the strengths of the genre is you don't want the romantic comedy to be about the person that necessarily goes to Everest. There's some conflict of storylines there. <laughs> Uh, and I think both have their merit, you know, and I think n- now um, I have earned expertise of the repetition of, of storytelling and, and being in it, right? For like 600 schools, I've not only spoken to a lot of kids, but I've listened to a lot of kids uh, around their perspective on pain and on purpose, on, on parenting, on what's happening in our culture, what's good with it, what's frustrating with it, what's hypocritical about it. Um, and so I think, it, uh, I don't think I always had this expertise. Um, I think I had the everyman expertise going into a lot of schools, but now that I'm 600, uh, deep and now that we like work on a more systemic level in education and I build curriculum and I work with a lot of experts on building that curriculum around empathy or kindness, 
that's now my expertise is just like lived experience. I, I guess how else do people do it besides climbing Everest, which is its own version of lived experience. And so for these children, uh, w- what are you inspiring them? Cause I, I'm trying to think, I do remember in elementary school, people would come in, talk. I can't say any of them dramatically shifted my life or motivated me to do anything. I wonder too, if some of the t- ways that were motivated are in passing, right? It's through example, right? The way the teacher mm-hmm. treated us, the way that the, like my scout master behaved at camp or when something went wrong. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess what are the, the lessons you're teaching them? And, and what are you, what are you hoping they change from like listening to you? Cause I, I'm, I, I would like to get a little bit of morning inspiration from you if, if you can <laughs> pretend I'm a, <laughs> uh, a seventh grader. Yeah. I mean, I, I think my, one of my speaking mentors, his, um, his metaphor that's always stuck with me is a, a great storyteller, a great speaker doesn't try to like, sow the field by throwing out a bunch of seeds and hoping one of them grows is the, the more impactful storyteller holds up a gemstone to the audience. And that gemstone is some sort of fundamental human truth that people may already like inherently in some ways know, but need to be reminded of or see it in a new perspective that motivates them into new action. And he goes, a great speaker, instead of giving you, hey, here's the 10 things I know about life or leadership or whatever it is, they hold up one thing and then they turn that gemstone really slowly to show you all the facets of that same truth so you get to know something deeply as opposed to something widely and when he first introduced me to that idea his challenge to me was like what is the thing that you believe in deeply that is sort of uh, an inherent human truth that people already know but you could reframe in some way for folks and 10 or 11 years ago for me it was fear is a feeling love is a choice that was like my mantra at age 22 and the thing that changed my perspective in high school was this like reimagining of what I knew love or compassion or kindness to be that it was something that I could choose to do, even if I didn't necessarily like a person. Uh, And it was something that in choosing to do it when it was least convenient was actually the best way for me to grow in compassion. And if I cared about or wanted at all to create at this time, a school that was like a more accepting, hopeful environment, safe environment, then I had to do work that wasn't event-based or project-based. It was much more human-based, much more me-based uh, around my willingness to act in kindness, especially towards the people that challenged me the most. What's the story relating to this that, that you would tell the students that that would be like, oh, that, that you know, I, I'm guessing you have one or I have a, I have a, fee- a hunch. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, there's a, a series of stories. I like weaving stories together. The probably the most profound, the the what I call the frame story, right? The the story I start a talk with and then I come back to it at the end because I think it encapsulates the need for what I'm talking about. Uh, it's a story about this woman named Helga, who I met on an airplane early in my speaking career nine years ago, and. Uh, I like to say that I hadn't been flying for work up until that point. Like I had no status on any airline. So I was sitting in the middle seat, which I affectionately call the hot dog seat. There's people's buns on either side of you and it's claustrophobic and you just want to take a nap. And this woman shows up, sits down next to me. And I know immediately that I'm not going to get a nap in. She's like ready to have a conversation. And at some point she introduces herself. Her name's Helga. uh, And she asked me what I do for work. I tell her I work in schools. She goes, Houston, I used to be a teacher. I used to be a high school teacher. What was your favorite part of high school? And I said, uh, and this is true. My senior year of high school, some friends and I, at the beginning of the year, we started this organization called Random Acts of Kindness, et cetera. Once a week, we would get together. We would talk about kindness. And then after we were done talking about it, we would go into our school and practice it. And as I'm telling Helga about this organization, she's, she starts crying. So I have a window seat woman weeping next to me. And uh, she goes, Houston, that is so important. I said, yeah, that no, was great. It was really like meaningful. We got to meet a bunch of new people. She goes, no, you don't understand how important that idea is to me. Uh, to which I said, you're probably gonna tell me. And she did. And she <laughs> launches into this story uh, about a true story. The three years before her and I met on this airplane, uh, she got a phone call early in the morning from her dad, her dad's doctor, excuse me. Her dad's doctor, uh, 
Helga, this woman, lives in Seattle, Washington, and her, her dad at the time in Phoenix, Arizona. So she wakes up to this phone call um, from her dad's doctor saying, Helga, I don't know where you're at, but the sooner you can get to Arizona, the better. We're taking your dad to the hospital. We're not exactly sure what's going on, um, but he's not doing real well. So to make a long story a little longer, she flies to the airport, doesn't pack a bag, gets on a flight five hours later. And as she's sitting ready to take off, ready to turn her phone on airplane mode, she gets another phone call from her dad's doctor explaining that her dad had passed away. And I'll never forget sitting on the plane with her, her looking at me saying, Houston, I'm on my way to go and see him when I learned that I lost him. Now she has to sit next to strangers. She can't get off this plane. She's on a, stra- a, a plane of strangers for three hours, flies to Arizona, lands at the airport, gets off the plane. She goes, I walk up to the nearest wall and I just fall down. Right? I put my head in my hands and I, I just crumble. She says, have you ever had a, 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 have you ever gotten news so bad that your body stops working right? You, know, you just fall to the ground. And the, the most profound moment of the whole story is she goes, Houston, I sat in that airport for two hours crying on the worst day of my life. And if she goes, if I had to guess over the course of two hours, 3,000 people probably walked by me in that airport. She goes, Houston, two hours, 3,000 people and not one. Not a single person stopped to engage. Not a single person stopped to help. And as she's talking to me on the plane, she goes, you have no idea how much I could have used an act of kindness that day. And that story, I, I always start with that story because uh, to me, it is this like this really practical evidence of need about this gap between what we collectively say is important and what we collectively are actually good at, which is you ask any of the 3000 people that walked by Helga in that airport that day, if they believed in kindness, I very much believe that nearly all 3000 would say yes. But did they act on it? No. And, and, I, and that gap is... Um, what I really, I guess I've spent the past decade trying to understand that gap. Uh, the work that I do with Character Strong tries to teach to fill that gap. Uh, and the book is designed to try to talk about why that gap is and, and how, we, how we close it. Um, because I think we like to think about kindness as this, this wonderful, fluffy, inspirational thing. Uh, when in reality, the, I think the true and present need for kindness looks a lot different than maybe how we traditionally think about it. Do you have more stories you want to share? I, w- I will say <laughs> the, when we first, one, I really like you. And when we first started chatting, it's nice. And when you tell a story, I'm engaged. Hmm. There's like this different way of listening that like when you tell the story, I'm, I don't know why in humans, I'm like, well, I have to stay, I have to hear the ending. I have to hear the, hmm. the, the moral. I'm well, not the moral, but I have to hear like the, the whole plot through. Um, and it's a really interesting way of telling any message. That, that almost that to me is the story. That, that, that kindness is one thing, but as well the story is, is just as powerful. Yeah, you could tell a thousand people that kindness is worthwhile and they would nod your head, nod their head with you. Uh, but as soon as you give them the evidence of Helga, as soon as you embody it, right? It, you can't not put yourself in the position or recognize that none of us totally. are immune to that adversity. At some point, we're going to be a version of Helga. <laughs> The most important thing is you help Helga and then you put it on your social so you can brag about how you've been kind. Like that is actually more important nowadays. I don't know if you know that, Houston. <laughs> it's about bragging how you're being kind, not actually being kind. Uh, yeah, there is a distinction between the two. I talk about it as being nice versus being kind, which is fun because already in the conversation we've used those fairly interchangeably, but I think the distinction is important. Oh, what's the difference? Is there a story about the difference? There is a story. You want to hear it? <laughs> God, I have other questions, but yeah, I got to hear the story now. Uh, yeah, it comes from speaking at a, at a high school in Texas, uh, about three hours away from anything that you could imagine, although the town did have really good pastries. Uh, and I remember speaking at the school, and after it was done, this high school boy came up to, to talk to me. And the kid, he's bigger than me. Uh, he's wearing two two bags, one that was academic, one that was athletic. Um, and, and he walked up and, and I have like a little bit of a radar for students who I think are going to give me a hard time. I think some of the average high school kids have already begun like the path down cynicism. And so a the concept of even a motivational speaker is like a natural turnoff. And so this kid looked cooler than me, and I thought he was going to say something smarmy to me. And instead he goes, hey, man, I just want to let you know that 
after listening to your talk today, I realized that I'm a really nice person. And I was like, I, I thought this was kind of like the joke. I was like, yeah, cool, man. That was good. Kind of the point, you know, <laughs> that was what I was going for. And he goes, no, I realize that I'm nice, but I'm not very kind. I was like, well, what's the difference? And you could tell that I think he found himself in a position that was like more vulnerable than he intended to, but he, he like walked the path anyways. And he was like, you know, I think nice is, is reactive. He goes like the people in my school, I think everyone here would, would consider themselves nice people because it's just a reaction. Like if I like you, I'll be nice to you. If I agree with you, I'll be nice to you. If, if you drop something, I'll probably go and pick it up. But like the way you talked about kindness today, he goes, I realize that if, if nice is like a reactive thing, he goes, I think kindness is a proactive thing. Nice happens like if, if I have the time, but kindness happens like if I intentionally make the time. He goes, I don't have to necessarily like you to be kind to you. I don't have to agree with you to be kind to you. You shouldn't have to drop your stuff for me to like help you in some way. And that was a turning point. I remember he, he got really serious. He goes, why do we always have to wait for bad stuff to happen in this world till we practice making people feel good? He goes, the way you talked about it today, you, you, you know, Helga, she says that kindness isn't normal. And he goes, I realize that kindness isn't normal for me either. And I realize that kindness requires a lot of work. And he looks me right in the eye and he goes, I, I think I have a lot of work to do. And I was like, yeah, man, me too. And those moments in my work are like, that's, that's where we get out of the one dimensionality, right? Like those in, in moments of where you see, and, and to your credit, to your story note, like the idea that you've, you remember kids or people coming in and out of your schools giving messages. Did you feel necessarily profoundly impacted by any of them? No. Uh, am I under any illusion that the entire audience walks out of their change because of my stories? No. Uh, but for whatever you know, recipe of ingredients, there are kids every once in a while in an audience who walk up and you can see that the like inclination of their heart, the inclination of their spirit has changed because they needed that story in that moment to give them permission to do something new or different. Um, and I, yeah, I, and I haven't kept in touch with the kid, but I genuinely think that he looks at kindness as something that he needs to work on daily now. Damn, I really wanted to throw a joke and like now he's in jail, but he's really nice to all the inmates. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Let's have a happy make ending. Your, let's, let's make your difference wherever you end up, right? That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Um, well, hold on, let's take a step diagonal on some of this because those are one, when you tell stories, man, so powerful and it, it, it really accomplishes a message. It's a good uh, lesson. And I also like the kindness uh, thing you're sharing as well. Uh, taking a step uh, diagonal, how did you find that? How did you f figure out this was your calling? And then how did you kind of get your first gigs around this? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I got invited into student leadership in high school by a teacher. Uh, and I, I remember going to a couple of like leadership conferences and hating it. Cause I was not at the time did not feel resonant with like the typical idea of the leadership kid, which was like pretty loud, pretty, very school coloried and like rah, rah excited. And I could play that game a little bit, but it wasn't my preference. Um, and then I went to this camp where I met John kind eyes guy. Um, and I remember feeling like, I don't know. I, I, I have you ever gone through an experience that was so transformational that you like wanted to share it with someone else <laughs> that, I mean, that was camp for me. It was like this gift changed the way that I saw everything, right? Our paradigms about the way we think about things changes the way we act with things. And I was so moved by it. that experience as like a delegate. I came back as a counselor. I've been a counselor at that camp for like 15 years. Um, that place is still a really important place to me. And when I went to college, I, I remember thinking to myself like, okay, how do I, how do I combine the things I'm most passionate about? At the time it was uh, theater and leadership to do something meaningful. And I got introduced to a guy who like spoke in schools. And I was like, you mean I get to like tell stories that aren't written by someone else. I get to make them up myself and I can talk about the things that were transformational to me. Um, that's when I realized I, like, I had permission to just 
smash interests together and see if we could make them work somewhere else. Um, and the very first gig I got was because of like previous investments, right? It's just relational equity. So I worked at that camp staff. Uh, and in working with that camp staff, uh, I would work with high school students from around Washington State where I grew up. And so when it was time for me to like, I wanted to do my first gig, I just started messaging some of the, the students or the teachers that I knew from that camp staff and said, hey, can I come talk to your like leadership class about this stuff? And I would go in, I would make up a presentation that was like an hour long and I would force myself to like get meaningful feedback from them in the moment. Like, what did you like about this? What did you remember? Uh, and I would just like iterate on that. And a lot of the people that brought me in, like when I was like, I'll come in and do this for free to your leadership class. A lot of those people that brought me in for free then were the ones that would pay me like my very first assemblies uh, that I got paid to do were like schools that had had me with their smaller group. They're like, hey, you ready for the big leagues? You know, ninth grade assembly, are you ready for this? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was me, like 22. I was like talking in some situations, you know, I was talking to like 18 year olds about how to live a more compassionate life. Was there a story or a moment that, sh that shaped your experience with that camp that made it so profound that, that led to this? Because I think, uh, and the thing is for a lot of people, including myself, we're all waiting for a call or the call is ringing, but we're not answering. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's powerful to notice or hear the Venn diagrams of life where you're like, hey, actually, I was in this camp. It was so meaningful yeah. that wanted me to help shape other people to, to live kind lives. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at that camp, <clears throat> John... John was a speaker there, and he told a series of stories that I found to be profound about his lived experience. Same deal, like not the drama version. You know, John hasn't gone and uh, conquered every peak or or made a you know jumped out of a very high plane. He, when he was in high school, he made a commitment his senior year to get to school an hour early, and stand at the door and greet kids. Uh, and John is a very persistent man, and he for 180 something school days, never missed a day. He would get to school an hour before it started, stand at the door, hold it open and just like shake people's hands and introduce himself. Like, that was his only idea. He like kind of accidentally became a, a student leader in his school. And his one goal was like, I want the people at, some, at, at Wenatchee High School where he went to school to know that I care. How do I do that? Well, here's one idea. And he just did it relentlessly, which is very on brand for him is like, consistency over everything else and in listening to him tell the story and uh, and along the way he ended up being joined like at some point he looked up and there was a line 70 people deep waiting to shake john's hand to walk in the building and i remember like hearing this story and being like what what is it about that that is so profound to me and i realized like i, I just wanted people to to trust that i cared just like a really funny um, line for the average like, 17 year old to draw. But I remember thinking like, I really care about people. But the reality is this idea of kindness. I think we assume rightly that everyone wants it. I think we assume wrongly that we can give it to everyone immediately. Because I think in order to receive kindness effectively, we have to trust the person it's coming from. And I think that's what John in his story so beautifully illustrated by talking about like, I earned this. I earned people lining up to say hello to me because I never missed a day. And, and then you spend time around John to your point earlier about like this embodiment piece where you have role models who live it. Now, John tells an amazing story and I listen to the story and I'm moved. And then you spend time around John and he's just like so present with you and so caring and so intentional. I remember early on in our relationship, we would like go to dinner and he would take notes about our conversation to follow up with me two weeks later about like, hey, remember you talked about this? Like, as your friend, I want you to know, like, I want to push you towards that. Like, how's that going? Like, that level of intentionality was how John showed up in so many of the things that he did. And so, yeah, all that to say, hearing John's story and then seeing John live his life was like, it was a transformational experience for me. And so now whatever it is, 15 years later, it's pretty cool that we get to run a business together. Yeah, that was great. 
there's some there's some nuggets of wisdom in there. Santa, there's greet lots- the kids at the door. I've heard a lot of speakers in my career as a speaker, and John's story about greeting people at the door and never missing a day to me is one of the most profound things that I've ever listened to. Yeah. I'm, I'm t- talking with your friends, the Yes Theory guy later today. And one of the first questions I want to ask for the people that don't know about Yes Theory, they do all these like amazing adventures or help other people do them too. And it almost gives the impression that like when they wake up, they're like in an ice bath and then at night they're in a fire pit. <laughs> and during the daytime, you know, they're eating alligator that they caught with their own hands. And, you know, it almost made me, you know, it's like when I read Elon Musk's biography, I was like, oh, you know, I, I, I help do deals or I help share stories. And I think it's easy to kind of look down on our own lives at times or for myself, like I'm not, and it's beautiful. And I think I've really, I was really thinking about it this morning. I'm uh, at the kitchen table and now hearing you and hearing John's story that I think for everyone out there, it, it doesn't have to be going to the moon. And it's just whatever we determine for ourselves, like showing up at the door being there at the crosswalk, maybe being a hostess, maybe being at the reception desk, or for me, just, you know, sharing these stories is like the most powerful thing that I can be spending my time on. I think it's, uh, I think for myself, sometimes I feel insecure or insignificant about that. Oh, I'm not building a car or I'm not building software. That's like doing some crazy shit. But then I I take a step back and I'm like, am I really enjoying this? Do I believe it's really helping? Does it matter to me? And the answer is yeah. And I think that it's nice to hear other stories relating to that for, for everyone out there. Yeah. Yeah. I think to me, one of the, the primary hopes of the book is to acknowledge that like the little things we do in kindness consistently are the things that add up to the most profound sort of purposeful things that we do in our life. Example would be a friend, Rick, who incredibly successful businessman. He was like one of the top 1% real estate agents in the country owned hotels and all kinds of things uh, and like a joy to be around, loved desserts, very well quaffed hair. Uh, and Qua- huh, what's passed, quaffed? You know, like, uh, like a, it's like a well blow dried, like a good, good poof. He always had good hair. Like it was well swished back. You look like you have great hair, by the way. I don't know if you know that. You too. <laughs> <laughs> Mitchell does too. It, all right. Okay. Keep day. going. She's... <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he, Rick, um, always someone I looked up to, you know, incredibly involved in the community. Uh, and he, he passed away a few years ago from a um, brain tumor, glioblastoma. Sorry to hear that. And his, at his, um, at his celebration of life, all kinds of people got up on stage and talked about his accolades and all sorts of things. But the final two people to, to speak were his two daughters, Alexis and Lydia. And they, um, they told a really simple and short story about how they both moved out of their their parents' house eight years before their dad passed away. And how every single day since the day they moved out, uh, it didn't matter if it was a random Tuesday or their birthday or anywhere in between, every day um, over the course of those eight years since the day they moved out, they got a postcard in the mail from their dad. Every day? Every day. Uh, yeah. So if you're doing the math, it's it's like something like 6,000 postcards total. And apparently some of the postcards were, you know, long and meaningful and profound and all the ways that he believed in them or loved them. And some of them were much shorter, like thank the mailman he deals with a lot of these or whatever, uh, or pick up the phone when I call you. But, uh, I reflect on, on Rick's story a lot of like this idea that Lexus and Lydia didn't bring up their dad's, you know, resume or accolades or GPA or community service hours or whatever. They brought up a big box of postcards. And, and I think about Rick as a busy man. I, I asked myself some questions around Rick, like, did Rick have time to write postcards? To which I would say, no, of course not. Rick made time because he felt like it was an important thing. You know, did he always feel like doing it? No, of course not. Like that's where discipline is a piece of the puzzle in productivity. But that's where like a lot of times, like the conversations around discipline typically end. It's always about like, making yourself better, getting a better body or, you know, making more money. But the concept of discipline, not always applied to compassion or generosity or kindness. And it really, one of the arguments of the book is like, that is an exercise in in the sort of kindness that the world needs, which is not these one-off experiences, but these really small 
demonstrations of love, which add up over time to be really the most profound things that we do. So whether or not Rick was a top 1% real estate agent or he went to the moon, the irony is no matter what he accomplished, probably Alexis and Lydia would bring up the same thing, which is a big box of postcards. Damn, your storytelling is good, my friend. My mind my goes, so goes, well, that's true. Sometimes I've, I've talked, like my buddy Grant Baldwin is a professional Hello, speaker. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I, I saw him speak, and I was like, dude, that was some of the most amazing speaking ever. And he said the same line. He's like, I, he's like literally, this is my job. I was like, oh, <laughs> like that's it's, it's phenomenal. I think there's some, some small things I'll highlight just for the audience and for myself. I like that you said their names the girls names I, I like that the stories teach really powerful examples but through simple kind of messages because if you just said like hey do something nice each day like okay but if you show it and you tell it uh, or show it, it it's very powerful i also never realized that the word businessman is the word, has the word busy in it hmm. yeah busy with an i but busy nonetheless yeah the french yeah. version it, it, the quaffs, a lot of quaff in that. And, yeah. Well, it's also very true that uh, everyone's busy, but what's important. And yeah. um, I'll say lastly, also, my first thought is like, or one of my thoughts was like, man, how much money in, in stamps is that? Yeah. Yeah. There are some barriers to access, certainly, but there's ways around that these days. I guess I was just trying to think what's something I, because then my mind leads to, you know, what's something I can start doing daily or weekly beyond what I'm already currently doing to, to exemplify or live that way. Yeah. But well, I would say postcards aren't a bad choice. You know, hashtag save USPS. You can, that's a good investment. <laughs> Buy those stamps, send those postcards. And, Dude, I have forever and, stamps. Bro. <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's like one of the, again, when we're, we're talking about the, the function of, of why I wrote the book is to help people figure what that thing is. You know, the, one of my favorite books is Power of Habit by Charles Dewey, which talks about how like 45% of our day is routine, which is like a nightmare statistic if you think about the context of your life, because it's like, well, 45% of my day is routine, which extrapolated out means like half of your life is on autopilot. And so one of the questions the book begs is like, what is the one, like when I stumble upon scary stats like that, it, it can for, if I am willing, it can force myself to ask myself, scary questions, which is like, if 45% of my day is routine, what percent of my 45% is designed to be kind? What percent of my 45% is designed to be patient or forgiving or any of these things that I say I want to be more of, but if I don't allocate the habitual time to it, then mm. oh, where does it go? So it talks a lot about like the 1% shift. What, is, what does it mean to take 1% of our day-to-day -day habit and make time or the practice of something like kindness. Okay, just to throw a curveball, why not do one percent meanness every day? <laughs> uh, that's a it's a great call. I guess I just haven't spoken about meanness for eleven years, so I don't feel as passionate about it. But I I would argue that there is already my guess is for most of us we already have one percent of meanness built in. Hmm. Meanness, That's I true. think, is, you know, is in some ways like a piece of our natural disposition, right? There is an element of selfishness uh, built in. And so we like we have to work hard in the other direction. That's a, I, I would agree with that. One thing that blew my mind yesterday, one of my favorite things to do is to look at the top selling books. I don't know why. I guess I've always done that. I like seeing what people are reading. And I will tell you, 50% of the books are about Trump. It's like mm -hmm. literally 50% of the top 100 books on Amazon are about Trump. It blew my mind. And uh, it's, I'm not, the point is about meanness and kindness, which, you know, it's not to debate him, but just how people are writing, they love him and people are writing, they hate him. And, mm. uh, just kind of how this, you're right. A lot of that is built in. I think one thing that I've been trying to shift internally was when you ask people how they're doing, one of the favorite phrases people love to say these days is no complaints, no complaints. And only recently I'm like, well, why are you complaining so much? Uh, and I know I complain a lot and I've been working on that, but I, I've been also just trying to say like many blessings or like super blessed instead yeah. of no complaining. It's just like, why don't we look at it? Like some of the, there's so many blessings going down. So maybe we can uh, start planting that seed. So, so walk me, ju or ju we'll jump ahead and then I got some other things I'm curious about. So you go from a summer camp to a motivational speaker. 
Um, what is the story then of how you led that to doing a book deal with Oprah and then connecting with the Yes Theory guys? It's a, <laughs> it's a pretty big gap. Yeah, there's a jump from like a middle school cafeteria <laughs> <laughs> to Simon and Schuster. Do they There's... give you do they give you a free lunch by the way? Do you get like a free lunch? Oh yeah. Yeah, it's uh it is uh an indictment on our education system anytime I get one of those free lunches just how terribly fed our but that's a that's a whole nother conversation. That's Is that was that even your agreement? Hold on, how much did you get paid for like these speaking gigs to middle schoolers? Uh the earliest ones um anywhere from like like when I first got started, like $500 or $700. Um, and then as time went on and you get enough reps under your belt, it became 1200 then it was 2500 and, um, and And before I stopped doing it as my, my primary work, I would do two schools a day for 5000 Each or 5000 total? Total. Dude, because when I'm thinking you're teaching schools, I'm like, oh, this guy's going to be eating, you know, I don't like saying eating ramen because ramen's really good. People are like, oh, he's got to eat. And I'm like, those 10 cent packets are awesome. But five G's a day. Like Mitchell, maybe we're in the wrong career helping like adults. <laughs> yeah. Well, the work, and- <laughs> the work end of it is, you know, it is the same reason why anyone would get paid for their experiences. Like you bringing someone in who, you know, you can trust with 2000 cool. middle school kids in a gym to deliver something that is like meaningful, engaging, and if something goes wrong, which it typically in some capacity does, like knows how to address it for both students and staff. Right? Like that's the earned wisdom and experience and street cred that you build through 500 stages. But the work that people, I think, you know, forget the less glorious side of the, especially working in schools is like, you're on planes every day. Uh, you're landing, you're taking rental car shuttles to Hampton Inn to wake up in a weird time zone adjusted. You have to be at 7.30 their time, which is sometimes four, you know 4.30 your time. And you speak, you spend all day engaging, and then literally you'll leave right from the school to go to hop on an Uber or back to the rental car to hop on another plane, to hop on another state, to repeat it again. And uh, that piece, you know, there are certainly objectively um, more challenging lines of work in terms of like certain metrics of that. But I'll tell you, for me personally, like that seven year sprint was uh, emotionally and physically really, really hard. That's, that's where the money uh, supported that like relentlessness. Well, before we jump into Oprah, one, it doesn't hurt that you look like Zac Efron, right? Like when you're talking to middle schoolers and they're like, oh my God, how did they get Zac Efron for 5K? It's such a deal, right? Like if they had me up there, they're like, oh, we don't want the bald Seinfeld. Like, can you get and I'd probably start swearing and just doing really inappropriate things too soon. You seem like you, you can handle that. And the other thing, I, I, I feel like there's got to be a bunch of these like single teachers you must have made friends with while you're out there. Okay, this is getting off track. So... <laughs> So you're living this life. How did you decide to stop after seven years? Because I think one of the things that it sounds like you appreciate about in others is that c- consistent relentlessness. And I think mm-hmm. that's a really good phrase, consistent relentlessness. It sounds like you you wanted that in yourself. Then how did you how did you pull the cord to say, all right, this is this is where I'm going to stop holding the door open, or I'm going to stop showing up these schools? Uh, yeah, I think it's just holding on balance, um, impact versus investment and realizing that my time and and eventually like what I'd learned through the experience was better used on a more systems level and over time became something I was like more interested in so in, in 2016 is when I partnered with John kind of nice guy talked about a lot today uh, to create character strong which he was a classroom teacher for 10 years uh, and then an administrator for five at the district level and I'd wandered around to 600 schools and he did some incredible work, like changing the culture of his school. And he he taught exclusively leadership, which is at the high school level, like pretty bizarre. He taught five leadership classes a day. Um, and he just did a lot of unique stuff. And I like always like looked up to him for not who he was, but what he was doing in his school. And I came to him and I was like, John, you've done transformational things in your school. You've started thinking about that. Like, how do you do that K through 12 in a, in a district? I was like, I've wandered around to 600 campuses. Like maybe there's a way to scale this concept to, to other schools around the country. So that was 2016. 
Uh, and now we actively work with 2,500 schools in all 50 states and nine countries uh, on the more curricular level, right? Like, so how do we not just have it be a speaker, but how do you strengthen that teacher-student relationship, which we know, as you mentioned, is like actually the thing over time that students are going to hold on to. So how do we equip educators to build that relationship really effectively? And then how do we teach the skills that like, from a philosophical standpoint on my end, is like, if my goal is to create a world where kindness is more normal, if my goal is to create a world where people stop to help Helga, if our organizationally, our goal is to create a more loving world, then we believe really deeply that like behaviors are the byproducts of, of skills that live beneath those behaviors. So the behavior of kindness is predicated on how equipped I am socially and emotionally um, to actually engage in that kindness. If I don't know how to do something, I typically avoid it. The gym is the example I always lean on. It's like I walk into Gold's Gym in Venice and there are a hundred machines, 98 of which I don't know what to do with. Uh, and so I typically don't use them, which I think is the same thing for kindness. If the only version of kindness that we know how to engage with is the fluffy, inspirational, high-flying, high-five, free hugs kind of version, then we will avoid the more messy work of sitting down to suffer alongside Helga. In the defense of the 3,000 people, you know, if someone's, if she looked homeless and is crying in the corner, like it could be someone on drugs and I'd be like, I don't want to get infected. I think, you know, it's kind of like the, what are the, the, the famous thing about people in the street, you never know who's going to call the ambulance because everyone thinks everyone else is going to do it. Yeah. Diffusion um, of responsibility. What's that? What, what was the, the technical phrase? Well, uh, like diffusion of responsibility or the bystander. Effect. Yeah. I think about it like yeah. in an elevator. The more people there are in an elevator, the easier it is to fart and get away with it. It's probably me, dude, honestly. No, but like <laughs> yesterday I was, uh, yesterday I was, or two days ago, I was biking in Arches National Park and this one car was falling off the cliff and I'm on my bicycle and I was like listening to a good song. So I couldn't help them because I was like, I got to finish this song because I really, I can't really help you while I, <laughs> I'm joking. But there was, there was like five people around helping this car. It was a Subaru Red, like they're trying to pull it back off the cliff. And I'm like, holy shit, I can't believe it's falling off the cliff. But there's five people around. And I said, well, do I need to go back and also help? And I was like, well, it, there's five people there helping them. So mm -hmm. I, I did, I kind of wondered, I was like, I, I wouldn't mind helping, but do I need to go and do that right this second? Yeah. There's actually research like on, there's... on that exact situation, which is uh, if there's w if you are the only other person in a circumstance of need, the likelihood that you engage is way higher. As soon as you add one other person to the equation, it decreases by like half and then half again. Uh, so each additional person who could be the person who does something reduces your likelihood to do something like half and half and over again, uh, which is exactly sort of the elevator farts model that it makes compassion unlikely in um, in particularly group settings where we can get away without without doing it. I just thought I'd be imp impeding it. I wouldn't think I'd be helping in that kind of situation. But one thing mm -hmm. I've noticed more this year than others, just in terms of where my headspace is at, is that um, in that book, I you know I just finished it this morning, so maybe it's a little bit fresh. The leadership and self deception. I think self-betrayal is knowing what we want to do in kindness or in niceness and then either listening to it or kind of or like negotiating it. And so I think I've been doing better this year where I'm saying, like I pitched, picked up a hitchhiker, what was that two months ago? And I was like, I don't know if I want to pick up this guy. He looks a little weird. And I was like, you should pick up the guy. And I was like, I'm going to pick up the guy. <laughs> and so I went and picked up the guy and he was really interesting. He was a goal. He it turned out he pans for gold. That's how he makes his living. Wow. Yeah, he pants for gold in Arizona, but and his car broke down in New Mexico, uh, or in Texas, excuse me. Anyways, it, it's just I think it's just listening to ourselves more, and I, I wonder if kindness is inside, like, and there is like a little kindness fairy, uh, mm -hmm. and whether we want to hear it sometimes, maybe is part of the the challenge. I, I mean, I think or whether we want to listen to it. To your point, I think there is. I uh, I mean, that's exactly the sort of competence that uh, I'm alluding to, which is three thousand people walk by Helga because they don't know how to diagnose whether or not is it is X situation or Y situation, right? So in my lack of ability to diagnose the situation, I give myself the, the permission slip to say like, well, someone else is probably better equipped, which may or may not be true, 
but it is the most readily available excuse to walk by. Uh, and so if I improve at the skills that live beneath the beha behavior of kindness, then it may be that I am more able to better read the situation, right? So in my, in mm -hmm. my, the time that I give myself to be more aware and in the cultivated expertise to be more aware, I might say, oh, maybe she looks like she's experiencing homelessness, but she's actually just disheveled because she's crying. And maybe she isn't strung out on something. This looks like she's genuinely hurting. And an ability to tell the difference between those two both takes time and effort and expertise, um, which are all things that we take for granted when it comes to the practice of kindness, because we just think that kindness is this thing that, well, of course, everyone deserves and everyone wants. But the reality is there's actually a lot of emotional skills working in concert to make that action real in that moment. Uh, and the same thing holds true for a car in arches where you're like, I don't, I, I might hurt more than help which is a, uh, a, really, uh, a really great excuse, which I can apply that same excuse in a lot of other parts of my life. Like, oh, I'm probably not the type that works out or I'm not the type that, you know, I didn't grow up eating healthy. I don't really even know what to make. Right? And those are the things that we shrug off in the moment. And then you look at the collective sort of pain that it causes, which is like, yeah, we've all taken a large step back from some of the broader cultural issues. There are too many people uh, participating in racism that we can all get away with farting in the elevator because none of it points directly at me until you know maybe I'm in a public eye or public spotlight. So I, 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 I appreciate those examples so much because I have those in my life and those are exactly the sort of subconscious excuses that if we take the time to better cultivate those skills, I think we are less likely to engage in in those self excuses. Yeah, I, I don't think I regret my choices in in those situations. And I think it's easy to be kind with money at times. Like, oh, let me tip mm. someone well. Like that's kind of a low hanging fruit kindness because there's no no cost. But two days ago, I was at this Mexican restaurant, Miguel's. I don't know if you ate there in Moab. Uh -uh. And I was like, man, this is really good food. Can you tell the chefs? And he's like, you can tell the chefs. And I was like, all right, I will. And so I went, and they don't speak English. And I was like, I went to the back and I was trying to do Spanish. And I was like, hey, I just, the uh, comida bien and, you know, food is good. And they were like, thanks. And I don't know if it, it's easy for me to tip them, but it's hard for me to go and actually go to the back of the kitchen, try to get their attention, wear a mask and say, hey, I really liked your cooking. Hmm. And that was, uh, and so I, I think from this conversation for me personally, it's made me reflect how, I think I'm probably the most kind person in the world that I know. <laughs> joking, I'm joking. I'm joking. Mitchell's like definitely not. No, I think it's just I was, I was joking. I just think it's it's going to make me more mindful of my reactive versus proactive niceness and kindness in the world. Not saying I have to go out and write postcards to everyone, which I did send my mom a postcard this week just to give myself some credit. I don't give myself <laughs> enough credit. That's one of my my things I'm I'm trying to do better on. Yeah. And uh but yeah, just being a little bit more mindful of it. And not saying I have yeah. to like, you know, pick up every car and do everything, but just be aware of where I think I can do more, or, you know, happy with where I am doing. I think that's really important. I mean, I think that is the aim and people will, um, I've had the question of like, do you ever feel frustrated with the imperfection of your own practice of kindness? And I'm like, yeah, all the time. Beginning of quarantine and stuff, I put out a like a 30 day kindness journal for people to participate in. And I was posting about it every day and um, just like really cool ideas and it started getting like halfway in and I was feeling overwhelmed and, I started not doing the own days that I was pitching people to do. And I have to remind myself that it is not always the point that we do everything every day, but the awareness of the sort of kindness I'm engaging in and then the awareness of the sorts of excuses I'm giving myself, give me a framework for improvement at this thing that I say is important. But collectively, we don't really have a good common language or, or a metric to, or an understanding of how to grow in our capacity for compassion. And I, and I, as I look around the world today, I'm like, well, that's what we need. We need to, we need to revolutionize the way we think and talk about kindness. And we need to give ourselves practical ways to improve at it or else we're going to continue to say it's good without ever really being very good at it. The few things I want to, I want to talk about, uh, as our time is this hour is there. I don't know what the fuck I just said. As hours coming up, I want to go over a few things before we wrap up. So how, tell us the, the Oprah story, the Oprah and the Yes Theory story. So for the people that know, you have a book that's out, and we'll talk a little about that in a moment. 
but you got a book deal with Oprah. That is a, a little bit of an uh, exaggeration, <laughs> but it is. Uh, I'll give you the story. I um, when I moved to Los Angeles, pretty early on, one of the, like the first friends I made there was this group of guys. They were going by Yes Theory, and they were uh, in the early stages of their YouTube channel. Um, and they've since grown to like seven million or something. How'd you they, how'd you meet them originally? I met them through a mutual friend. His name is BC, who was like staying at their house and went over one night. And uh, BC was there. The S theory guys were there. A, a silver medalist Olympic diver was there because they had just jumped out of a helicopter into the ocean together. And uh, my friends Dalton and Alex were there, who had run, who had done six cross country tours doing acts of kindness. And so we all started talking about discomfort and kindness and the relationship and. Um, have been friends for like four years now and uh, I've known them for a long time and um, they've been buddies first and then they they you know their content for so long was just was just YouTube oriented and they wanted to begin to get into the live event space so they held their first yes live is what they called it uh, in October of last year and they asked me to be um, like the closing speaker of the night so I had an hour to talk about empathy and its relationship to discomfort and how to create a more kind world and, and why their whole thing is seek discomfort. Like, why is it that kindness is the epitome of that pursuit? And it went really, really well. It was awesome. I like my, when I do work like that, my goal is to always make it really experiential and have people experience connection with someone else and to remove some of those barriers that we typically put up in the face of connection. And one of the kids who came up to me afterwards, uh, he was a kid in this audience, he's like 16 or 17, and he talked to me about how much he loved the message and if I could come talk to his school. And I later learned he, he sent me an email and he copied his mom. And I thought that was weird. So I looked at his mom's name and, and she's run like PR for Oprah for like 10 years and has helped run the Oprah Winfrey Network. Uh, and so I responded to both of them. I was like, yeah, I'll come talk to your school. Also like, hi, mom. <laughs> What's going on? It turns out she was there that night as well. And uh, this young kid apparently had been having a little bit of a hard time. So the fact that I reached him was really important to his mom. And his mom um, was like very thoughtful. She's like, I worked with Oprah for a long time and you're a really good storyteller, like better than a lot of people we've had on Oprah. I'm like, that's awesome. That's a really good compliment. Thank you. Uh, and so long story short, as we're talking about me coming to visit this kid's school, um, at some point, the fact that I was writing a book and I was like literally in the middle of writing the book in the early stages when I met these two and she's, and I was planning to self publish. Uh, and she's like, do you have a publisher? I was like, no, do you know someone? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, I actually do. And, uh, through a series of other serendipities that I won't bore you with, I, I got connected to a few folks at this uh, imprint called Tiller Press, which is a, a fairly new imprint at Simon and Schuster. Um, that deals with with like the wellness space and like and culturally relevant things. And so this woman, Nicole, introduced me to the Tiller Breast team. I was like, hey, I met this kid uh, at the you know talking and I think you should check out his book. Send the book proposal and like two weeks later, I'm walking through the airport. I get the email saying they want to bring me on and and Ellen DeGeneres at the same time is walking by me in the airport and I'm like, this is like a uh, uh, more on Ellen later, but like a kindness overload. Um, and yeah, that's how I went from self-published to Simon and Schuster was thanks to a very caring mom who just happened to work with Oprah. The woman that runs Tiller Press used to be head of content for, um, uh, for the company that Oprah helps run about dieting, nutrition. You'll you know to get it. Called. You'll get it. I know, you know, but take it, 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 take it. I'm not going to cheat. You have to use your brain. Use it or lose it, my man. Uh, Weight Watchers. Uh, there it is. There it is. Can't do everything for other people. Uh, Weight Watchers. Um, she used to run a head of content for Weight Watchers. And so uh, Anya, who is at Tiller Press, knows Oprah well and has worked with the Oprah team a bunch. And so those those circles collided in uh, September 29th. Now we have a book coming out. It's pretty exciting. All right, a few things to go over. One, you should go to sendfox.com right now and literally start a newsletter because there's no real good newsletter on your site. And that is the best way to sell your book. Great. 
We, yeah, Seriously. we have we have an email list with character drawing, but I don't do a newsletter. I should. I know. I'm on HoustonCraft.com, and if you're trying to sell your book, if you look at all the best book sales, James Clear, Tim Ferriss, and, and, and I guess more of the space I'm familiar with, Ryan Holiday, yep. Ramit Sethi, including myself, like email list is their biggest thing. And I think for you to, you know, keep sharing your message that's positive, like that'll be a great way for you. So it's free to start sendfox.com. Uh, it's what I, I use and we also built it. Um, but I think for you, especially with sharing your message, it'd be super yeah. effective. I'm into it. Send yeah. Fox. So if you need help setting that up, taking up yeah, send Fox. To com. Noah, send Fox. Com. I'll check. I can check back in two weeks, just like John, if you want, or I'll tell Siri. <laughs> Please. It's a nice site. Remind me in two weeks to follow up with Houston craft about sendfox.com. <laughs> this is the kind of, but you should do it. Yeah. I you should like. do it for your personal stuff. Yeah, I'll follow up with you in two weeks. It's no, dude, it's official now. So I would do that because have use sumo.com and add a pop up or just like put a link here to for your landing page. But this is a great way to start promoting your book. Um, second thing around your book, Deep Kindness, is that who should I buy it for? So I, it's already in my cart right now, but I was like, who the hell do I send it to? Hmm. Um, I think anyone that you know who feels frustrated about the current like fracturing of the world. Um, the mm -hmm. divisiveness of the world would benefit from reading this book and recognizing that uh, the most important work we can do right now is like the messiest work, which is just identifying that we're both a part of the problem and, and the key to the solution. So I think anyone who you think uh, likes reflecting on themselves and cares about um, making the world a slightly more compassionate place. Are you going to be the male Benet Brown? Oh, don't, don't sweet talk to me like that. No, that's like my favorite oh, baby. series of <laughs> words. Uh, Dr. Benet, <laughs> Benet Brown is one of my favorite authors and speakers on the planet. I've worked with her daughter um, before in like the leadership context. And uh, Brené and I have met before. And that's like, that's, yeah, one of the peak life goals would be to do something alongside her. I think she's brilliant. Speaking of the documentary style of speaking that I love. She like coined data with a soul. She's so good at it. I'm still not clear who I should send it to. I have so many friends who are angry. That's also a good <laughs> use case. They can get no, equally uh, frustrated at the state of kindness. I don't know. I'll have to think about that. I think you should make it a little bit, uh, not you should. It might be helpful to have something a little bit more clear, like send it to a guy or send it to a girl that, um, hmm. All right, I'll have to. I'm just gonna pick someone in my Amazon list to send it to, and they're just gonna get a random act of kindness. I like that. All right, but this it's person. actually a pretty intentional act of kindness. It's good. Oh, I, yeah, you're right. It's not actually as random. Hopefully, he still lives here. Oh, he's a good dude. All right. Translation was terrifying, by the way. Like, yeah, I'm really. I feel very comfortable doing this in front of a live audience, but to capture it so permanently was. That's the challenge of, of writing. And I was humbled by that process for sure. Yeah. I'm just looking at the questions. So you're dropping the book, doing all this tours. Um, a few other questions around it and we'll, we'll tidy up. Uh, what's up with all the rings you wear? <laughs> uh, all right. Strong observation for those not uh, able to visualize this in the podcast form. I do have a few rings on my fingers uh, and they come from my mom. My mom, when I was in middle school and high school, worked at a jewelry store and at different uh, important life events, she gave and gifted me rings. And so I wear them uh, because I like my mom a lot and I wear them because they remind me of pivotal events and uh, because at some point I thought to myself, these look cool. I like these. Go you. All right. I just ordered it for a friend in Vegas. I Perfect. hope he enjoys. And all right, hold on. purchasing. All right. Purchased. Um, we're talking to the yes theory guys later today. What, what, what should we ask him? What do you think would be fascinating to find out about these guys? Uh, I would love for that conversation to steer toward. I know a bit uh you alluded to it a bit but like i think the impression of their life via their videos is so much about like this wild discomfort in sort of these extreme events and i think 
the acknowledgement of the sort of discomfort they pursue in quieter moments is important. I think the discomfort in the relationship to that discomfort when it comes to things like connection um, to themselves and the connection to like friends and their family uh, is important. Um, and I know like on the personal level, they've just, yeah, they've struggled, especially during this time with like, if we can't fly all over the world and do these crazy things to make epic videos, like, you know, who, who we are, are we as creators? And, and then who are we as individuals? If so much of what we create is like the message that we live. I think that um, for them is stuff that they've been wrestling with a lot. If you want to start with the hot tub talk for non-alcoholic beers. Oh, do they not? I love non-alcoholic beers. Dude, I was pounding one last night. I had, had two. I was getting a little wild. <laughs> dude, there's Klaus Dollars. Klaus Dollars hopped. Oh, dude. I got to give this a try. If, I'm usually a kombucha guy, but I'll go to Klaus Dollars. Klaus Dollar is a German beer. They have the regular and then they have hopped. They also had grapefruit, which I, I didn't feel like I, I wasn't in a fruity mood last night, but I haven't been drinking for a while. I think what's interesting about this time not drinking is I'm not trying to keep track which is it's a whole nother uh, discussion. I just don't want my yeah. brain to get adjusted right now. I don't want to get altered. I'm just happy with uh, my brain lately. Um, one thing that, that we've talked about, I, I would be curious, do you have any guidance or direction you could point me and everybody else t towards telling better stories? Hmm. And then maybe, and then lastly, if we could have the, the Houston craft challenge of kindness, what would, what would we end with? Hmm. What would that be? Uh, yeah. Storytelling wise, um, you brought up, brought up a piece of it earlier. And the way that I think about it is anchor points is like uh, you want to give people a coloring book, not like the full picture. So you want to provide mm. anchor points that create an outline for people's brains. Um, but in order for them, for a person to feel fully engaged, you can't give them all the details. You have to give them a framework so that they get the joy of like coloring in some of it themselves. So you give like names and maybe like a, the color of the door or like as you did really lovely earlier, you were like, it was a red Subaru. Right. You didn't give me the mm. whole picture of Arches Park, but I, I've been there. So I get to fill it in with some of my imagination or someone who hasn't might fill it in with their own version of Arches. But I still see I see five people around a red Subaru because those are anchor points you provided me to create a very small piece of the narrative. So anytime you can make it collaborative by giving key details and then allowing people to fill it in with their own colors is a um, is it helps make it a like cooperative experience. Um, the second part would be wisdom from my one of my mentors, which is never be the hero of your own story. Uh, so I always like when I'm thinking about the stories I want to tell to point to a message, I always try to think about those questions of like, when was the time I didn't do this well? Or who's the person I know that's done this really well? Uh, or when was the first time I learned about this? And how did it humble me? Um, so even if you've done something well, it's like, you don't have to avoid talking about successes, but how do you talk about those successes through a lens of humility? Because no one cares about the things you did really well. People want to know how you learned it or how you were humbled by it or who taught you it along the way. And then the third piece would be like point it towards that gemstone. So instead of trying to do 10 things decently, try to do one thing really well. And I like, I always picture that turning the gemstone slowly. So you're, you're seeing a lot of facets of the same truth that yeah, you got one. Oh, you got the AirPods case. Very similar gemstone. It's like a gem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's like, how do you explore all the features of one item as opposed to like, the, here's our entire inventory. Um, and I think people naturally, when it comes to storytelling, want to provide all of their knowledge all at once. I do that totally. Uh, yeah. Which is like, it's a natural, like wanting to prove ourselves uh, especially if there's a fear of insignificance uh, that like we want to give that all at once to make it. Yeah. You're like, wait a second. Why were you pointing at me? You dick. <laughs> so I, Your like, words. This <laughs> fucking <mine>. guy. <laughs> no, I'm pointing at myself. No, that's, um, that's definitely resonates. That hits on. Yeah. And it's just like, if we can do one thing really beautifully and well, it'll always be more resonant and more keepsake worthy than a whole handful of pebbles. Do you keep a story log because that was one thing that I, I was like as you started talking i was like man maybe i should keep more stories like here's different stories that i can use in different situations i tried that at one point and, and i know other people that do that um and you could some people would just call it journaling which is like great uh i think when you start to get into the business of like over 
tagging your life. I mean, if you're into that sort of like organizational approach, it's just like not me. You know, I don't write out my talks. I like, I just think about, hey, here's the truth I'm trying to point to. And here are the, um, the three to five stories that I want to tell that best represent different facets. And the, the real work for me is like, one of the rules I give myself is like, tell the story like I see it in my mind. So it'll always sound a little different because I'm like, I'm literally replaying the video of it in my brain and trying to translate that live. The work of a, of a great talk, I think, is like, is the transitions. How do you naturally weave together those stories? Um, so if there's anything that I like worry about or write down, it is transitions over tagged topics. But that's just me. And what would be the Houston Craft Challenge that we can give the audience today? Hmm. Uh, well, you could, you could deepkindnessjournal.com has 30 days of kindness on it still um, that you could download. That'll be updated <clears throat> actually really soon with, some, with a fresh look. But uh, that has 30 days uh, that the promise is it is one action a day, 10 minutes or less, totally free and can all be done physically distanced. Um, and the premise of it, the model, right, I, I tend to resist trying to be like, try this one. Um, but the model is think about yourself as the person you have most immediate access to and then move outward from there. So what can I do today for myself that's kind? And then tomorrow, what does it look like to do something for my family member and then a best friend and then an acquaintance? Um, so that's the model of the journal as it moves from myself outwards and then back inwards. So but do if, the 30 days of kindness. But if I were to offer you an exercise for you today it would be uh one of my favorites is day one in the journal is write down something that you love about your past self your present self and your future self i did this with my roommates and it spurred like a two-hour conversation that was really beautiful i dig it houston craft book is deep kindness we'll uh, be putting this out soon everyone go check it out thanks noah thanks mitchell Well, that's a wrap. I hope you loved the episode as much as I did. If you enjoyed it, make sure you go buy Houston's book, Deep Kindness, on Amazon. Next, text a friend you love them. Yo, dog, let's go do something kind for another person today. And before you go, tweet at me, at Noah Kagan, and let me know what you thought of this episode.